Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The sense of being watched suddenly started to creep in. I decided to watch TV to divert myself. The moment I switched on the TV, I felt someone right next to me on the couch. I turned to my right and no one was there. But the feeling would just not go away. The reclining chair on the corner of the room started to shake as if someone touched it. I immediately turned my attention to the chair and notice something. I cannot explain it properly. It was a dark, dwarf-like shadow that just went past the chair. I was shocked. But then, since there are trees in the neighborhood and the lights are on in the apartment, I immediately told myself that it is the shadow of the trees, and I did not want my mind to believe that it was anything else. And then I turned back to the TV. I heard a loud bang in the kids' room and suddenly one of them started to cry. I ran to the room to see if he was all right, only to find him on the floor. He said the old man pushed him from the bed. The kid showed his leg, and I could see the imprints of a hand on his leg. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… A woman keeps seeing her deceased father-in-law out of the corner of her eye. The sad tale of Mary Mallon still haunts us today. You might know her better as Typhoid Mary. John George Haig took the plunge into murder when he knocked out his old boss and dumped the body into acid, then set out to kill again. A girl in an almost empty movie theater feels someone or something tugging at her shirt. They spoke a strange language had bright green skin and were utterly inexplicable. Who were the green children of Woolpit? A ghostly boy appears outside a restaurant in Nebraska. A dark house, a babysitter, an unexplained noise, and a shadowy figure. Normally the setup of a cliché horror movie, but this time it was real. Over the last two decades, there have been frequent reports of a ghostly woman who wanders the halls of Greystone Mansion, leaving traces of lilac perfume in her wake. Plus, is the White House haunted? The evidence seems to build more and more every year. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. About eight years ago, I had moved to Houston, Texas. I didn't know many people, but I was religious at the time, so I joined a church. One of the members of the congregation worked at one of the Edwards theaters in town. He invited me to come to a movie, as he could sign in a guest on days that he was working. I decided to go see the movie The Help while it was in theaters. I was very excited because I'd been looking forward to seeing this film. I went to the theater and picked out a seat in the middle of one of the empty aisles. As more people filed in, one person decided to sit three seats down from me. This was the only person who was anywhere near me in the theater at all. 
About halfway through the movie, I felt a tug on my shirt. I thought it was the person next to me playing a joke on me, but when I looked over, the other patron was still three seats away from me, fully immersed in the movie. I think I'm just imagining things and go back to watching the film. About 20 minutes later, as I'm watching the movie, I feel another tug on my shirt, and by now I'm pretty angry, so I look over again, but the only person near me is the same patron, three seats away. I go back to watching the movie, still annoyed and suspicious of the person still seated three seats away from me. Fast forward a few months later, and my friend who worked at the theater started talking about the ghosts in the theater. He was very animated about this and told me about several different events that have happened more than once. To add some background to the area, the land that the theater is built on used to be a very large steel mill. There were supposedly several industrial accidents on the site over the years that it was still operational. My friend told me that there have been a few sightings of a soldier who was seen crawling up the stairs, then disappears into a wall. This soldier has been seen by different individuals, according to my friend. He also said that people tend to feel uneasy if they see the specter and come out to notify management. By the time management gets to the specific auditorium, the soldier is always gone. Other patrons have reported having their clothes tugged on, as I had while watching movies, and there have been employee reports that the projection booth also has unexplained activity involving tugging of clothes. It's been a few years since I moved away from the Bayou City, but I don't think I will ever forget that theater. Back when I was supporting myself through college, I worked in a fast food restaurant in Omaha, Nebraska. I was walking back to the kitchen after cleaning a table on a regular day. I saw a little boy standing outside of the door. He just looked like a normal little kid, so I smiled and walked on and didn't think anything of it. He didn't have anyone with him that I could see, so I asked him if he was lost. He just looked at me and smiled. I walked over reached out my hand, and it went through him, like my hand went straight through him. I was completely shocked. He then turned and I watched him as he ran out and disappeared into the parking lot. I asked another member of the staff and she told me that several people had seen him. Nobody really knew anything about him or where he came from. Apparently, he would just make appearances every now and again, seemingly at random. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Greystone Mansion, owned by the city of Beverly Hills for many years, is a place that is instantly recognizable for those who love movies and television. It has appeared in so many productions that the grand staircase at the entrance is said to be the most filmed and photographed stairs in Hollywood, but no thriller ever filmed there can boast the plot twists of the real-life murder mystery that occurred in the house in 1929. It began with two bodies in the bedroom, and it's never ended because the crime has never been solved, leaving a lingering mystery and a lingering haunting behind. The sprawling mansion was built in 1928 by Edward L. Doheny, an oil tycoon and rival of John D. Rockefeller. The mansion, designed by Gordon Kaufman, 
who had also built the Hoover Dam and the iconic Los Angeles Times building, cost over $4 million, which made it the most expensive home in Southern California at the time. Doheny himself never lived there. He had had the house built as a gift for his son, Edward Ned Doheny, Jr. But Ned didn't get to enjoy it for long. On February 16, 1929, just five months after he'd moved in with his wife Lucy and their five children, he was found dead in a guest bedroom in the east wing of the mansion. He was not alone. Also lying dead in the bedroom was his longtime friend and assistant, Hugh Plunkett. The events of the night were pieced together from Ned's wife, Lucy. She said that Plunkett had let himself into the house with his own key, as he always did, and went to the east wing. She had not been alarmed by anything until she heard a single gunshot. Lucy called the family doctor, not the police, E.C. Fishbaugh, and together they had gone to the east wing. As they approached the bedroom, they saw Plunkett standing in the hallway, holding a gun and looking upset. He immediately rushed back into the bedroom and another shot was fired. When Lucy and Dr. Fishbaugh entered the room, they discovered the bodies of both men. When the police arrived, veteran detectives became suspicious of this story. The witnesses seemed to have rehearsed their stories, and the sequence of events seemed questionable. Why had Lucy called the doctor first, not the police? Why did the bodies appear to have been moved? Why were the police not called until almost 2 a.m. when the shots had been fired between 11 and 11.30 p.m.? If Plunkett had committed suicide, how had he managed to shoot himself in the back of the head? But these questions were not asked for long. Within a few days, the official conclusion was that things had occurred just as Lucy had claimed, a murder-suicide, and the case was closed. A few detectives were unhappy about the decision, but the orders had come down from the top and any further investigation was stopped. Doheny and Plunkett were buried close to each other at Forest Lawn, and that should have been the end of the story, but rumors still swirled around town about what really happened on the night of February 16th. Some made note of the fact that Doheny was buried at Forest Lawn, a secular cemetery, even though he was Catholic. His family made large donations to the church every year, and the only thing that would have prevented his burial in a Catholic cemetery was if he had committed suicide. So whose body was actually found first? What really happened that night? One unfounded rumor claimed that Ned and Hugh were lovers and that their deaths were the result of a fight about their relationship. In the 1920s, even in Hollywood, such relationships would have been kept secret. This story gained a lot of attention, with some alleging that Lucy had walked in on the two men and shot them both herself. In truth, though, this theory likely had nothing to do with what occurred that night. Around the time of Ned's death, his father, Doheny Sr., was embroiled in the Teapot Dome scandal. This bribery incident that took place during the administration of President Warren G. Harding and involved Secretary of the Interior Albert Bacon Fall, who leased Navy Petroleum Reserves at Teapot Dome in Wyoming and two other locations in California to private oil companies at low rates without competitive bidding. One of those companies was owned by Doheny, and in 1929, Fall was found guilty of accepting a $100,000 bribe from him. Both Ned and Hugh Plunkett had been implicated in the case, and it's most likely that the murder-suicide, regardless of who killed whom, was the result of a growing fear about their illegal business practices and the very real threat of prison time they were now facing. One of the men killed the other and then turned the gun on himself. Lucy Doheny and the trusted family physician were left to try and salvage some shred of decency for the family out of the entire mess. Or at least that's what may have happened. In truth, we will never know. But whatever happened that night, Greystone remains haunted after all of these years. The lingering spirit is not either of the men, but Ned's wife, Lucy. Lucy managed to weather the scandal of her husband's death, and a few years later, she remarried. She and her new husband, financier Lee Batson, 
continued to live in the mansion, raising her children. The couple later built and moved into a new home nearby, and Lucy sold the bulk of the Greystone estate in 1954. The mansion itself was sold in 1965 to a Chicago-based developer who never lived there. Instead, he rented it to movie studios. Later, the city of Beverly Hills bought the mansion, leasing it for a time to the American Film Institute, then turning it into a park. The mansion now plays host to private parties and is often featured in television shows and movies, including the critically acclaimed 2007 film about the early oil industry, There Will Be Blood. Lucy spent the rest of her life in her new home near Greystone. Towards the end, she lived to be a hundred and died in 1993, she would get dressed up each day and then sit in a wing-backed chair near the front door with her purse clenched in her hands. She was apparently waiting for something, but she refused to say what it was she was waiting for. She never spoke publicly about what happened that deadly night in what the newspapers called the Palace of Grief, and perhaps that is why her ghost refuses to rest. Over the last two decades, there have been frequent reports of a ghostly woman who wanders the halls of Greystone, leaving traces of lilac perfume in her wake. Perhaps she still has a story to tell about a dark night in 1929, but whether she will ever tell is a mystery as chilling as the one surrounding the deaths of the two men that occurred that night. There aren't many 900-year-old stories that still captivate listeners, but one has stuck around for at least that long. Of course, when the said story involves children with green skin roaming the English countryside, it's a bit easier to understand the tale's longevity. There are three historical accounts from the 12th century detailing the appearance of these strange children, most notably William of Newburgh's. His History of English Affairs, written in Latin, gives us some of the earliest known stories of vampires and zombies returned from the dead. The three historical accounts vary slightly, but only in their details. During the reign of King Stephen, two children, apparently brother and sister, appeared mysteriously in the English village of Woolpit. Woolpit gets its name from wolf pits dug in the Middle Ages to protect the town from wild beasts. One autumn, during the harvest, villagers found the two strange children climbing out from one of those pits. They wore unusual clothing and spoke a language no one understood. But the oddest thing about them was their green skin. The children were the color of leaves. They seemed confused by foods offered to them eating only raw beans for many months. Stunned, the villagers of Woolpit nevertheless took in the young strangers. They even went so far as to baptize the children. The boy, who appeared to be younger than his sister, grew ill and died shortly after being baptized. But the girl survived, and after a time she started eating other food and lost her green color. She also learned how to speak English so the villagers could finally learn her story. She said she and her brother came from a place called St. Martin's Land where everything was green. She said they had been herding their father's cattle when they followed the cows into a cave and became lost. They followed the sounds of bells and emerged in our world. One of the historians who recorded the green children's story says the girl was given the name Agnes and went to work as a servant in the household of one of the villagers, Richard Decane. She reportedly gained a reputation for being very wanton and impudent, but eventually settled down and married. Explanations for the origins and meanings of this story vary widely. Some later historians insist it is pure fairy tale, 
but many say it probably has its roots in a true event. This was a period of civil strife throughout Europe. The children may have been orphaned or even kidnapped. There were many Flemish-speaking immigrants fleeing persecution and coming to England at the time. That may be the strange language the children spoke. And some diseases caused by malnutrition like anemia can turn the skin green. That might explain why the boy died and why his sister lost her green color after eating a larger variety of food. Whatever the origin of this story, it is likely that its endurance comes from the fact that it is about lost, vulnerable children who are also mysterious, otherworldly, and just a little frightening. The conflicting emotions of protectiveness and fear they invoke may be why this weird story still has the power to fascinate after 900 years. As a teenager, 18 years back, I had the opportunity to bloat my piggy bank by babysitting my neighbor's twins. They were seven years old and pretty naughty, but did all the things at the right time – eating, sleeping, playing, etc. Never had problems with them and loved to babysit them. Once I was asked to take care of them for eight hours – 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. on a Saturday. Kids usually go to bed by around 9-ish and I thought I'd have two hours to watch some TV shows. So I was preparing the bed for the kids in their rooms when one of them asked if I could stay in the room with them. When I asked him why, he said he's scared to sleep alone and said that his mom usually stays in until they both sleep. I accepted and agreed to stay in until they both fell asleep. So I just started to narrate a bedtime story when I heard someone walking in the hallway. It was quite surprising because Mrs. Beckerman told me she would reach home by 11 and it was around 9.15 p.m. I called out her name and I had no response. So the curious young blood of mine wanted me to go check who it was. I obliged my curiosity and stopped reading the story to the kids and stood up when I heard the noise again, this time more like running but just outside the door. The hallway is a straight line with rooms on both sides leading to the living room. I immediately opened the door and did not see anyone. Slowly getting scared inside, I brushed aside my assumptions and turned the lights on in every part of the house. I wanted to be brave as it would be hard to control the kids if they got paranoid, so I checked the house for any intruder, but no one was there. I bolted the doors again and walked back to the kids' room. Suddenly, I felt someone behind me, like a cold, heavy breathing. I turned back and no one was there. I once again brushed my thoughts aside and just told myself that my mind is tired. This time, the hallway seemed a bit cold and that's not something that is common in Kansas in August. Nevertheless, I checked the temperature of the apartment and it was set to a fixed 75 degrees, but the temperature of the house was 63 degrees Fahrenheit. I was surprised because things were normal a few minutes back. I adjusted the temperature and waited until the temperature improved to 73 degrees. After that, I went to the kids' room. One of them asked why I looked so tense. I did not want to frighten the kids, so I did not say anything about my feeling. To lighten the mood, I made them sing and dance for a while, but that made them even more tired so they quickly fell asleep. So by 10.15 p.m. I still had 45 minutes for Mrs. Beckerman to return. While I was trying to forget what happened earlier, the sense of being watched suddenly started to creep in. I decided to watch TV to divert myself. The moment I switched on the TV, I felt someone right next to me on the couch. I turned to my right and no one was there, but the feeling would just not go away. The reclining chair on the corner of the room started to shake as if someone touched it. I immediately turned my attention to the chair and noticed something that I cannot explain properly. 
It was a dark, dwarf-like shadow that just went past the chair. I was shocked, but then since there are trees in the neighborhood and the lights are on in the apartment, I immediately told myself that it's the shadow of the trees and I did not want my mind to believe that it was anything else. And then I turned back to the TV. I heard a loud bang in the kids' room and suddenly one of the twins started to cry. I ran to the room to see if he was all right, only to find him on the floor. He said the old man pushed him from the bed again. I was shocked. I told the kid, there is no old man in the apartment. It was just me and them. The kid showed his leg, and I could see the imprint of a hand on the leg. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I ruled out the possibility that the other twin pulled him down, as the mark on the leg was not from a kid's hand. It was as big as mine. I went out of the room to check the apartment, but as it happened before, the hallway was empty and no one was to be found. I locked the kid's room from inside and sat next to them. I comforted the kid and put him to bed and stayed in the room when I started hearing the footsteps again. I shouted by requesting whoever it was to leave the kids and go out of the apartment. The footsteps stopped right outside the door. I was not sure whether to open the door or not. After some five minutes, which seemed like an eternity, I opened the door and saw the same shadow, the one I saw next to the chair earlier, on the wall, unmoved. I kept staring at it for a few seconds when it slowly moved away and disappeared out of the hallway. Now, I was totally convinced that it was not the shadow of a tree because the hallway does not have any windows and the only light that falls in the hallway is from the light that was on. I started to panic and immediately called Mrs. Beckerman, who said that she'd be home in less than a minute. It was a big relief for me. I immediately narrated all the incidents to her as soon as she got back home and she rushed to the kids' room to see what happened to her son. She fell on her knees and started to cry, and then she said this is not the first time they were experiencing this. Thus far, the entity had never harmed her or her kids, so she never felt that it was trouble. But now, since it was able to touch and harm the kids, she was getting very worried. I called my mom, a tarot card reader with a bit of experience in communicating with spirits, to come to Mrs. Beckerman's house immediately. As soon as my mom entered the apartment, even before we narrated the story to her, she started to stare at the hallway and asked us if everything was okay. I was shocked to see my mom react this way because she did not take her eyes off the hallway while asking us a few questions. This scared the crap out of me, but still I kept asking my mom why she was staring at the hallway. She refused to answer and told Mrs. Beckerman to sleep at our house with the kids for the night. The next morning, my mom and Mrs. Beckerman invited a priest to their apartment to have it blessed post that incident, Mrs. Beckerman stayed there for a couple of years before she decided to move out of the colony owing to the transfer of her job from Kansas to Texas. Recently, five years back, when my mom and myself were having a discussion about how hard it was for her to raise me when I was young, I suddenly remembered this incident. Since I was old enough to understand her now, I asked her why she acted in such a way at Mrs. Beckerman's house that night. She explained that she saw a man who had a hunched back looking at us from the hallway. The man looked very upset and angry that she immediately felt a bout of negative energy run through her after entering the house. She, sensing that it was not advisable to stay there until the entity was controlled, asked Mrs. Beckerman to bring the kids and stay with us. I was speechless for a minute and then told my mom that I'm proud of myself that I still managed to safeguard the kids and survive two hours of hide-and-seek with the hunchback old man. I do not know who it was, and I have never seen that thing again, but those two grueling hours in the apartment has given me every reason to not forget the incident.
On a lonely night in 1946, President Harry S. Truman went to bed at 9 p.m. About six hours later, he heard it. Knock, knock, knock. The sound against his bedroom door awakened him. He wrote to his wife in a letter that is archived in his presidential library and museum, I jumped up and put on my bathrobe, opened the door, and no one there, he wrote. Went out and looked up and down the hall, looked in your room and Margie's, still no one. Went back to bed after locking the doors, and there were footsteps in your room whose door I'd left open. Jumped and looked, and no one there. The damned place is haunted, sure as shooting. Secret Service said not even a watchman was up here at that hour. You and Margie had better come back and protect me before some of these ghosts carry me off. In addition to its political ghosts, the White House has long housed unsettling specters of a different, more bump-in-the-night kind, if numerous former leaders and their staff members are to be believed. Whether one embraces or mocks the paranormal, the many accounts that have spilled out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue over two centuries give ghosts an undeniable place in the country's history. They also make that address arguably the nation's most famous haunted house. The sightings, which have been documented in eerie detail by scholars and newspapers, involve a former president who appears when the nation needs a leader most, a daughter who pleads in vain to help her doomed mother, and a first lady who is, sadly, perpetually stuck doing laundry. Jared Broach is the founder of the company Nightly Spirits, which offers tours of haunted areas in several cities across the country. But when Broach started the tours in 2012, he offered only one, the White House. The White House has the best ghost stories, and I'd call them the most verified, Broach said. Honestly, we could do a 10-hour tour if we really wanted to. One of his favorite stories is about David Burns, who sold the land where the White House sits and whose voice has been reportedly heard in the Oval Office. I'm Mr. Burns. Broach would always say during tours when he got to that part of the story. Asked if he believes in ghosts, Broach said, for sure, and then pointed to more prestigious authorities. If I said no, I'd be calling about eight different presidents liars, he said. One of them would be Abraham Lincoln. He reportedly received regular visits from his son Willie, who died in the White House in 1862 at the age of 11 of what was probably typhoid fever. Mary Todd Lincoln, who was so grief-stricken by the loss that she remained in her room for weeks, spoke of seeing her son's ghost once at the foot of her bed. There were also reports of hearing Thomas Jefferson playing the violin and Andrew Jackson swearing. After his assassination in 1865, Lincoln apparently joined his son in the phantasmal roaming. First Lady Grace Coolidge spoke in magazine accounts of seeing him look out the window in what had been his office. Many more sightings would come in the decades and presidential administrations that followed. Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands was sleeping in the Lincoln bedroom in 1942 when she reportedly heard a knock on her bedroom door, opened it to see the bearded president, and fainted. Two years earlier, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, according to accounts, had just stepped out of a hot bath in that same room and was wearing nothing but a cigar when he encountered Lincoln by the fireplace. "'Good evening, Mr. President,' Churchill reportedly said. "'You seem to have me at a disadvantage.'" In his research, Broach said he found that Lincoln seems to be the most common visitor among the White House ghosts and also the one who carries the greatest burden. They say Lincoln always comes back whenever he feels the country is in need or in peril, Broach said. They say he just strides up and down the second-floor hallways and raps on doors and stands by windows. In a 1989 Washington Post article, White House curator Rex Scouten said that President Ronald Reagan had commented that his dog would go into any room except the Lincoln bedroom. He'd just stand outside the door and bark. Scouten said. Among other spirited stories are those about Annie Surratt. Some have sworn her ghost knocks on the front doors, pleading for the release of her mother, Mary Surratt, who was convicted of playing a role in Lincoln's assassination 
and later hanged. There are also haunting accounts involving two presidents' wives. Abigail Adams was the first lady to live in the White House and use the East Room to dry sheets. Since her death, there have been reported sightings of her likeness in that area. She walks, according to the accounts, with her arms outstretched, as if holding clean linens. Dolly Madison, if the stories about her are to be believed, seems to have chosen a better eternal pastime, taking care of the garden. During the Woodrow Wilson administration, staff members reported seeing her ghost as they were about to move the rose garden. They apparently decided afterward to leave it where she wanted it. The First Lady is also connected to another storied Washington location. When the British burned down their home during the War of 1812, she and President James Madison moved to the Octagon House on the corner of 18th Street and New York Avenue Northwest, making it the temporary White House. Unexplained occurrences there have been linked to the deaths of three women, including two daughters of the wealthy man who built the house. In both incidents, according to the newspaper accounts, the women had argued with their father about who they wanted to marry and then fell from the same staircase. Bells could be heard in the house when no one was there to ring them, reads a 1969 Washington Post article about the location. A specter of a girl in white could be seen slipping under the stairway. Terrifying screams and morbid groans could be heard emanating from the house. Some insisted that it was impossible to cross the hall at the foot of the stairwell on certain days without unconsciously going around some unseen obstacle on the floor. Newspapers once treated stories about ghosts with far less skepticism than they might today. Washington Post article published August 13, 1907, describes the police department's effort to address paranormal activity in Georgetown with the headline, Spooks Baffle Police. Despite the vigilance of Captain Schneider and his officers of the 7th Precinct, they continue, night after night, their weird and ghost-like tricks, the author wrote. The police are unable to stop the shower of gravel and stones, which appear to be the favorite means of manifestation of these materialistic ghosts, nor are they able to discover whence they came. The headline for a 1903 Post story which ran next to an advertisement offering a lawn swing for $3.95 said, White House Ghosts – Changes in the Mansion Have Driven Them Away. In the article, a longtime White House servant lamented how renovations had cleared the mansion of the spirits that kept him company on lonely nights. He described them as gliding up public stairways and down private ones. It's the truth, the gospel truth, said Jerry Smith, who was described as spending a quarter century at the White House. Times are not what they used to be about the house. Ever since I first went to the White House, I've seen the spirits of Mr. Lincoln and other presidents as they died. But you know that they don't like new places, and I never see a sight of Mr. Lincoln or General Grant. But Lincoln, it seems, would not be scared away so easily. Mary Eben, who worked for Eleanor Roosevelt, reportedly seeing him on his bed, pulling on his boots. Her screams apparently brought Secret Service agents running. Mrs. Roosevelt, in a 1932 talk about life in the White House, told a group in San Antonio that she felt another presence when she worked in a room where many presidents had also worked. I get a distinct feeling that there is somebody in the room, she said. After Truman wrote to his wife about the knocks on his door, the president's daughter wrote him back. Margaret Truman, in a 1986 biography of her mother, said she and her mom were skeptical of the existence of ghosts, presidential or otherwise, and she wrote her father saying so. In his reply, he said, I'm sure they're here, and I'm not so much alarmed at meeting up with any of them. I'm sure old Andrew Jackson could give me good advice and probably teach me good swear words, he wrote, according to the book, and I'm sure old Grover Cleveland could tell me some choice remarks to make to some political leaders, so I won't lock my doors or bar them either if any of the old coots in the pictures out in the hall want to come out of their frames for a friendly chat. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. 
This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird dark roast very vampilla. The only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Throughout my life, I have had very vivid dreams which, on many occasions, have actually become reality. I also tend to get flash images of people and events. When I see people, for whatever reason, they seem to appear in the corner of my left eye. I know that sounds crazy. I'm not talking about seeing deceased people only. Approximately a year ago, I had a very vivid dream about Pop, my deceased father-in-law. All his grandchildren called him Pop. In fact, our grandchildren also call my husband Pop. Well, the dream that I had about Pop was that he was trying to get me to board a plane, which I did not want to do. I won't go into specifics about that as this account is not about a dream. In fact, after I churned the dream around in my mind, it turned out to be figurative and he was quite right in trying to get me to board the plane which in my dream I did not do, but in reality actually did do. Excellent advice from Pop. After this dream, I kept seeing Pop in my left eye. I would love to know whether other members have experienced this. He was always wearing a white and blue checked shirt, which he often wore in life. I tried talking to him out loud in my mind, but got no reaction whatsoever. All he did was appear in my mind or my eye. Eventually, I had this brainstorm. He was trying to communicate with his son, my husband, but could not do so. If the ghost were to hit Brian over the head with a cricket bat, he wouldn't acknowledge it. So in my mind, Pop was using me to get his son to communicate with him. I dutifully told Brian to sit quietly on his own and to talk to his father. I told him what he said didn't matter, just please try to communicate because your father is driving me nuts. He did so, probably just to get me out of his hair, but said he didn't feel a thing. He did not feel the presence of his father at all. Fast forward about 10 days or maybe a couple of weeks, my son had alarming news regarding his financial situation. He's happily married and has two children, a daughter and a son. Craig is a highly qualified electronic engineer and was earning a very, very good income. Because of the problems with the mines, which were and still are the main source of income in his company, he had to take a 30% decrease in his salary. This would affect anybody pretty badly. You live according to your income, and although he isn't a spendthrift, he and his family had to lower their lifestyle very drastically. Now, the following event was witnessed by his wife and a very good friend of his. One Saturday afternoon, he had been mowing his lawn when his friend arrived at his house with a few beers. At this stage, Craig was still very low, wondering how he was going to cope with private schooling for his kids, and so on. Craig had noticed a young dove which seemed to hop from tree to tree while he was mowing the lawn. When he and his friend sat down in the garden to enjoy a beer, this dove perched itself on his shoulder. His friend actually took a few pics of it on his cell phone. This dove sat on his shoulder, according to Craig, his wife, and his friend, for at least half an hour before Craig took it off his shoulder and put it on the branch of a tree. It then flew off. He and I discussed this incident, and we both agreed that the dove was the spirit of Pop. I have never again experienced the presence of Pop. Just to mention, Craig was very close to him, and he was very proud of this specific grandchild for a number of reasons – achievements under adversity and so on. I would really love to know what other people think of this. To me, it was just too much to be a coincidence.
red wine, ice cream, a warm bath. These are wonderful ways to unwind after a long day at work. But, as we've seen time and again, even the most soothing of activities can be twisted into terror by a madman's dark imagination. Such is the grisly case of John George Haig, a serial killer from England who used bubble baths of acid to dispose of his victims. Born in 1909 to an ultra-religious Plymouth Brethren family, John George Haig was raised in Yorkshire, England. His upbringing was strict, to say the least. His father reportedly constructed a 10-foot fence around their yard as a means of blocking out the neighbors. With no playmates, young John grew up alone. At night, he was haunted by nightmares. The first signs of trouble appeared in his early 20s. After a series of odd office jobs, John was fired on the suspicion that he had stolen company money. His life took a brief turn for the better in 1934 when he married a woman named Betty Hamer, but the marriage fell apart. Soon after, John landed himself in jail for fraud. While behind bars, Betty gave birth to a baby girl whom she put up for adoption. John's conservative parents refused to accept the decision and forever shunned their son from the family. Alone, John moved south to London where he picked up work as a chauffeur for a wealthy businessman named William McSwan in 1936. Yet his criminal ways bubbled back up. For the next seven years, John was in and out of jail for various crimes. It was during this time that he dreamed up the perfect murder. How can one kill and then truly get rid of the body? Sulfuric acid, of course. To test his plan, John caught mice and submerged their helpless bodies in acid. There he saw it. The critters were gone within 30 minutes. In 1943, John was freshly released from prison and reconnected with his old boss, William McSwan. William invited the freed convict to dinner at his parents' home in celebration. Shortly thereafter, William disappeared. John told William's parents that the man had gone into hiding to avoid being drafted into World War II, but the truth was far grislier. John had lured William into his basement where he cracked him on the head, then dumped him into a 40-gallon barrel of sulfuric acid. Within a couple of days, William went from grown man to goop. Afterward, John moved into William's estate, claiming the businessman had asked him to do so. But with World War II drawing to a close, William's parents wondered why their son remained in hiding. They soon voiced their suspicions to John. He knew of one way to quiet the fussy people. Give them an acid bath. With the entire McSwan family now out of the picture, John began cashing William's pension checks. He sold off their belongings for around 8,000 pounds, 300,000 in today's pounds. With money in hand, the killer moved into the Onslow Court Hotel in London's posh Kensington district. Eventually, however, the funds ran out, especially after John gambled much of it away. While on the hunt for more cash, the killer spotted a promising real estate ad in the local paper. He traveled to the home of Dr. Archibald Henderson and his wife, Rose. Pretending to be an interested buyer, John soon struck up a relationship with the affluent couple. In February of 1948, John convinced his newfound friends to take a drive into the country and visit his new workshop in West Sussex. Upon arrival, John gunned down the Hendersons and dumped their bodies in the baths. He then collected their belongings and pawned it off for money. Yes, the acid bath murderer had cooked up quite the chilling racket lure wealthy acquaintances out to his workshop of horrors, send them to the vats, then sell off their possessions for cold, hard cash. John's next and final victim was Olive Durand Deacon, a wealthy widow living at the Onslow Court Hotel. Of all possible things, Miss Durand Deacon wanted to meet with John to discuss a brilliant new idea, artificial fingernails. John happily invited her to his West Sussex workshop 
where he shot her dead and submerged her body in acid. This time, however, the acid bath murderer failed to cover his tracks. Detectives soon connected the missing woman to John and began looking into his lengthy record of prior arrests. When authorities searched his West Sussex workshop, they found evidence of Mrs. Durand Deacon plus some papers referring to his earlier victims. As for the body-erasing acid baths, the plan was not as foolproof as John thought. A pathologist identified three gallstones and a piece of denture among the remaining sludge, objects that could withstand a slathering of sulfuric acid. Authorities arrested John and charged him with murder. He soon confessed to the killings. The man pled insanity, claiming he had been driven mad by a childhood nightmare that returned to him as an adult. I saw before me a forest of crucifixes which gradually turned into trees, John recounted of the dream. At first there appeared to be dew or rain dripping from the branches, but as I approached I realized it was blood, the whole forest began to writhe, and the trees, dark and erect, to ooze blood. A man went from each tree, catching the blood. When the cup was full, he approached me. Drink, he said, but I was unable to move. The courtroom had little interest in John's strange vision. A guilty verdict was handed down on all counts. In August 1949, John George Haig was put to death by one of England's longest-serving executioners, Albert Pierpont. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, Jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. The year 1906 marked a turning point in American medicine. It was the year when the new science of bacteriology gained public attention when it was used in the investigation of a typhoid outbreak in New York City. The outbreak was a mysterious one to the doctors at the time because it led the authorities to a healthy woman who was unknowingly spreading the disease. As these same authorities struggled to convince her that she was infecting the people she worked for, they eventually quarantined her for 26 years, starting on March 27, 1915. The story of Typhoid Mary has had a lingering effect on American history. Her name alone has become a metaphor for fear of contamination from contagious disease, and her plight now symbolizes the need to balance the civil liberties of disease-carrying individuals when the population at large is at risk. Her story has had other lingering effects as well, namely on the place of her confinement a now-abandoned hospital on New York's North Brother Island, is one of the ghosts that still walks the hallways of the hospital that of Typhoid Mary? Perhaps, for hers was a strange history. The tale of Typhoid Mary began in the summer of 1906 when New York banker Charles Henry Warren rented a summer home for his family in Oyster Bay, Long Island. The house was rented from George Thompson, and a large staff was hired, including an Irish immigrant named Mary Mallon, who was employed as a cook. On August 27th, one of the Warrens' daughters became ill with typhoid fever. 
Soon after, Mrs. Warren and two maids also became stricken with the same symptoms of high fever, diarrhea, vomiting, chills, and a rash. Days later, another daughter became sick, as did the Warren's gardener. In all, six of the eleven people in the household came down with typhoid. Since the most common way that typhoid was spread was through food and water sources, the owners of the house feared that they would not be able to rent the property again without first discovering the source of the outbreak. The Thompsons first hired investigators to look into the situation, but they were unsuccessful in finding the cause. Then they hired George Soper, a civil engineer who had experience with typhoid fever outbreaks. It was Soper who believed that the recently hired cook, Mary Mallon, was the cause of the sickness. Mallon left the Warrens about three weeks after the outbreak and went to work for another wealthy family. Soper began researching her employment history, looking for clues. Mary Mallon had been born on September 23, 1869, in Cookstown, County Tyrone, Ireland. According to what she told friends, Mary came to America at the age of 15. Like many Irish immigrant women, she found work as a domestic servant. She became a cook, which paid better than most domestic service positions. Soper traced Mary's employment history back to 1900 and found that typhoid outbreaks had followed her from job to job. From 1900 to 1907, Soper found that Mary had worked at seven jobs in which 22 people had become ill, including one young girl who died from typhoid shortly after Mary came to work for her family. Soper was convinced that this was not a coincidence, and yet he needed stool and blood samples from Mary to prove that she was a carrier. The idea that someone could be healthy and still carry a disease and spread it to others was a concept that had been announced by Robert Cook but had not been proven yet in any individual. Mary, Soper knew, might be the first such person discovered by science. In March 1907, Soper found Mary working as a cook in the home of Walter Bowen and his family. Soper needed samples from Mary and he confronted her at her place of work. She was shocked as anyone would have been. As far as she knew, she was quite healthy and now she was being approached by a stranger who not only told her that she was spreading some sort of disease that was killing people, but wanted her to give samples of her blood and her feces. Mary not only refused, she became quite angry. Soper later wrote, I had my first talk with Mary in the kitchen of this house. I was as diplomatic as possible, but I had to say I suspected her of making people sick and that I wanted specimens of her urine, feces, and blood. It did not take Mary long to react to this suggestion. She seized a carving fork and advanced in my direction. I passed rapidly down the long, narrow hall through the tall iron gate and so to the sidewalk. I felt rather lucky to escape. But Soper was relentless in his pursuit. He followed Mary to her home and tried to approach her again. This time, he brought an assistant, Dr. Bert Raymond Hubler, for support. Again, Mary was enraged and made it clear that they were unwelcome. She cursed at them as they made a quick retreat. Soper, now realizing that it was going to take more persuasiveness than he was able to offer, handed his research and theories over to Herman Biggs at the New York City Health Department. Biggs agreed with Soper's theories and sent Dr. S. Josephine Baker to talk to Mary. After Soper's clumsy attempts to obtain blood and stool samples from her, Mary was now extremely suspicious of doctors and health officials. She refused to listen to Baker and sent her away. Baker returned a short time later, this time with five police officers and an ambulance. When they arrived at the house, Mary met them at the door with a long kitchen fork in her hand, likely the same one she had chased away Soper with, and lunged at Dr. Baker with it. As Baker stepped back, colliding with police officers behind her and knocking them down the steps, Mary slammed the door shut and made a run for it. By the time they got the door open and followed in pursuit, Mary had disappeared. Baker and the policemen searched the house but found nothing. Eventually, footprints were discovered leading from the house to a chair placed next to a fence. Mary had apparently escaped into a neighbor's yard, or so they thought at first. 
They searched both properties for the next five hours until, finally, they found what Dr. Baker later described as a tiny scrap of blue calico caught in the door of the areaway closet under the high outside stairway leading to the front door. Mary was dragged from the closet, fighting and swearing, and even though Dr. Baker spoke to her calmly about the specimens that she needed, Mary refused to listen. Dr. Baker wrote, by that time she was convinced that the law was wantonly persecuting her when she had done nothing wrong. She knew she had never had typhoid fever. She was maniacal in her integrity. There was nothing I could do but take her with us. The policeman lifted her into the ambulance and I literally sat on her all the way to the hospital. It was like being in a cage with an angry lion. Mary was taken to Willard Parker Hospital and there, the specimens were finally taken. Laboratory results showed that Mary indeed had typhoid bacilli in her stool. She was a carrier of typhoid fever. As the first healthy typhoid carrier in New York City, Mary was made an example of by public health officials and was punished for her resistance to their tests. She was promptly detained and was quarantined on North Brother Island, located in the East River near the Bronx, which housed hundreds of individuals infected with highly contagious tuberculosis and other conditions. The otherwise healthy Mary Mellon was confined in a cottage on the island, making newspaper headlines and creating her infamous nickname of Typhoid Mary. Mary had been taken by force and was being held against her will without a trial. She had not broken any laws, but because of the fact that she was a lowly Irish immigrant with no money or political clout, and also because she was infected with an illness that people dreaded at the time, she found few to rally to her cause. Mary believed that she was being unfairly persecuted. She could not understand how she could have spread disease and caused a death when she herself seemed healthy. She wrote, I never had typhoid in my life and have always been healthy. Why should I be banished like a leper and compelled to live in solitary confinement with only a dog for a companion? Public officials felt that they had every right to lock up Mary indefinitely, basing their power on Sections 1169 and 1170 of the Greater New York Charter which read, The Board of Health shall use all reasonable means for ascertaining the existence and cause of disease or peril to life or health and for averting the same throughout the city. Said board may remove or cause to be removed to a proper place to be it designated any person sick with any contagious, pestilential, or infectious disease shall have excluding charge and control of the hospitals for the treatment of such cases. The charter was written before anyone knew that healthy carriers, people who seemed healthy but carried a contagious form of the disease that could infect others, could even exist. But the health officials of the early 1900s believed that healthy carriers were even more dangerous than those that were sick with a disease because there was no way to visibly identify a healthy carrier so that they could be avoided or quarantined. For this reason, they had no issues with locking Mary away for as long as they deemed necessary. Mary was initially confined for two years on North Brother Island, during which time she wrote letters and filed a legal suit pleading for her freedom and release from the island. During the time of her confinement, health officials had taken and analyzed her stool samples about once a week. The samples mostly came back positive with typhoid, but not always. For nearly a year, Mary also sent samples to a private lab which tested all of her samples negative for typhoid. Feeling healthy and with her own lab results in hand, Mary believed that she was being unfairly held. But in truth, Mary did not understand much about typhoid fever, and unfortunately no one tried to explain it to her. Not all people have a strong bout of typhoid fever. Some people have such a weak case that they only experience flu-like symptoms. Because of this, Mary could have had typhoid fever without knowing it. Though it was commonly known at the time that typhoid could be spread by water or food products, people who are infected by the typhoid bacillus could also pass on the disease by not washing their hands after using the bathroom. For this reason, infected cooks like Mary or food handlers had the most likelihood of spreading the disease. In 1909, Mary argued to the Supreme Court that she was never sick and was never given due process before her confinement. The court ruled against Mary, 
setting the precedent for the courts to rule in favor of public health officials when individual liberties were at stake. Mary was remanded to the custody of the Board of Health of the City of New York and went back to her isolated cottage on North Brother Island with little hope of ever being released. In 1910, however, the new health commissioner of New York decided to release Mary as long as she agreed to regularly report to the health department and to promise that she would never work as a cook again. Anxious to regain her freedom, Mary accepted the conditions. On February 19th, she was let free. Mary vanished into obscurity after her release. But not for long. In January 1915, the Sloan Maternity Hospital in Manhattan suffered a typhoid fever outbreak in which two people died and 23 others became sick. During the investigation, evidence pointed to a recently hired cook, Mrs. Brown, who was actually Mary Mallon using a false name. Some believe that Mary never had any intention of following the conditions of her release, but most likely she found that not working as a cook forced her into domestic positions that did not pay as well. Feeling healthy, Mary still did not believe that she could spread typhoid. Mary first worked as a laundress and at a few other jobs, but for some reason that has never been documented. Mary eventually went back to working as a cook. If the public had shown Mary any sympathy during her first period of quarantine because she was an unknowing typhoid carrier, it disappeared after she was locked up again. This time, Typhoid Mary knew of her carrier status, even if she didn't believe it, and so she willingly and knowingly caused suffering and death to her victims. The fact that she'd been using a false name made her look even more guilty. On March 27, 1915, Mary was sent back to her cottage on North Brother Island and she remained there, imprisoned on the island for the next 23 years. The exact life that she led on the island is unclear, but it is known that she helped around the island's Riverside Hospital, earning the title of nurse in 1922. In 1925, she began helping in the hospital's lab. In December 1932, she suffered a stroke that left her paralyzed. She was then transferred from her cottage to a bed in the hospital's children's ward, where she stayed until her death six years later, on November 11, 1938. In the years that followed her death, the term Typhoid Mary stopped referring to Mary Mallon and became a term for anyone who had a contagious illness. People who change jobs frequently are also sometimes jokingly referred to as Typhoid Mary. Mary Mallon changed jobs frequently. Some believed that it was because she knew she was guilty, but it was likely because domestic jobs at the time usually didn't last long. But how did Mary become such a legend? Yes, she was the first healthy carrier to be found, but she was not the only one discovered at the time. An estimated 3,000 to 4,500 cases of typhoid fever were reported in New York City alone, and it was estimated that about 3% of those who had typhoid fever became carriers, creating more than 90 new carriers a year. Mary was also not the most deadly. There were 47 cases of typhoid connected to Mary, while Tony LaBella, another healthy carrier, caused 122 people to become sick, with five deaths. LaBella was only isolated for two weeks and then was released. Mary was also not the only healthy carrier who broke the health officials' rules after being told of her contagious status. Alphonse Cotless, a restaurant and bakery owner, was told not to prepare food for other people. When health officials found him back at work, they agreed to let him go free when he promised to conduct his business over the phone. So why was Mary singled out? Why was she the only carrier isolated for life? These questions are impossible to answer. Some historians believe that it was prejudice that contributed to her extreme treatment by health officials. She was Irish. She was a woman, uneducated, a domestic servant, had no family and was basically a nobody. She didn't have the money or the position to fight back, and when she did, she was dismissed by the courts for all of the same reasons. Despite Mary's temperament and her violation of the conditions of her release, one has to wonder if the crime really deserved the punishment she was given. 
The question remains unanswered today, which is perhaps the reason why her spirit is still said to linger at the abandoned hospital where she spent her final days. North Brother Island is a place of ghosts. It lies on 13 acres just southwest of Hunts Point in the East River. It is a remnant of a long-forgotten era in New York history. The island has been abandoned since 1963 when the city closed down Riverside Hospital, which had opened in 1886, to treat and isolate victims of contagious diseases. It gained its notoriety during the tenure of Mary Mallon and remains a mysterious place today, off-limits to the public because it is the nesting place of a species of rare black-crowned herons. It is without question a spooky place, and some say a haunted one. Time seems to have bypassed North Brother Island's gaslight-lined streets, brownstone hospital buildings, crumbling doctors' houses, and sandy beaches littered with cookware and heavy glass tonic bottles. Tragedy first bloodied the island's history in June 1905 when the General Slocum disaster took the lives of 1,141 people, most of them German immigrants from the Lower East Side. They were on their way to a Sunday picnic on Long Island when the overcrowded steamer was accidentally set ablaze. The ship ran aground on North Brother Island and doctors and patients from the hospital ran to try and save the hundreds of passengers who had jumped from the burning ship. For hours after the tragedy, bodies continued to wash up on the island's shore and the beaches were strewn with victims. For decades after, Island residents spoke of seeing the ghosts of these victims as they wandered the grounds, weeping for their lives and those of loved ones lost in the disaster. Perhaps these spirits do not walk alone. Riverside Hospital was closed as a quarantine hospital in 1942. It was abandoned for a short time before briefly being used as a housing for World War II veterans who were studying at New York colleges. It was serviced by two ferries that regularly stopped at the Western Slip, but this proved inefficient and expensive, and when cheaper housing was found for these men, the island was abandoned again. In 1952, it opened again, this time as an experimental juvenile drug treatment facility that was offered as an alternative to going to jail. The tuberculosis pavilion of the hospital, which was built in 1942 and never actually used to house tuberculosis patients, became a dormitory and then a main residence and treatment building for the program. The doors to many of the rooms were retrofitted into seclusion rooms with sheet metal reinforcement and heavy deadbolts that could be used for withdrawal management. The experimental plan would take a patient newly arrived and addicted to heroin and place him in one of the rooms with no conveniences except for a bare mattress and a mess bucket they would be forced to undergo withdrawal in the seclusion room without any kind of medicine. After several days, when withdrawal was complete, the patient would be introduced into the general population. It was believed that this harsh return to reality, followed up by a stay of no less than 90 days on the island and bolstered by athletics and education, would provide the best chance against relapse. All of the buildings on the island were renovated. The services building became the school, the nurses' residence became the girls' dormitory, and the tuberculosis pavilion became the admissions hospital and boys' residence. The building next to the tuberculosis pavilion, originally the hospital's children's ward where Mary Mallon spent her final days, was turned into a library and annexed to the school. The grand experiment was a failure. Recidivism rates were extremely high, and even at the isolated island hospital, patients still found means of obtaining and using drugs. There are accounts of boyfriends making the trip to the island in order to visit in the middle of the night, accounts of orderlies getting paid in cigarettes to smuggle heroin on the ferries, and accounts of physical and sexual abuse on and by patients. The hospital was shuttered and the island was abandoned in 1963 for the final time. The lost souls of this era certainly left an indelible mark on the island, but the most famous troubled spirit that may linger is that of Typhoid Mary herself. Mary was first quarantined on the island in 1907 after causing a number of outbreaks of typhoid fever. She was set free 
in 1910, but returned to the island five years later after an investigation into an outbreak of typhoid at a Manhattan hospital revealed that she was once again working as a cook under an assumed name. She was sent back to her cottage on the island, this time for good. Mary never understood that she was a carrier of a possibly deadly disease. Instead, she felt she was a victim of persecution at the hands of officials who could neither prove that she was the source of these outbreaks nor explain to her why she felt so healthy and why she seemed free of any type of typical symptoms of typhoid. In 1938, she died on the island due to complications from a stroke she had suffered six years earlier. Mary's cottage was demolished after her death. Officials felt that it was unsafe for habitation, but she spent much of her time working and later dying at Riverside Hospital, where her ghost is still believed to walk. Over the years, visitors to the island, those who brave the river and the warnings against trespassers, have reported the spirit of a woman who wanders the corridors of the crumbling old hospital. She has been seen a number of times by a wide variety of people, including staff members at the hospital during the era when the drug treatment program was in place. One account details an orderly who followed the woman down a corridor only to see her walk into one of the rooms. Thinking that one of the inmates had gotten out of her room, the orderly hurried down the hall and entered the exam room, only to find there was no one there. Was this woman one of the many tragic spirits of North Brother Island, or could it have been the ghost of Mary Mallon, unable to rest after nearly three decades of punishment that she never felt she deserved? No one will likely ever know for sure. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Pop was written by Melda for YourGhostStories.com. The Lingering Ghost of Typhoid Mary is by Renee Cruz and Troy Taylor from the book A Pale Horse Was Death. The Acid Bath Murderer of England was written by Stephen Casal for TheLineup.com. The Haunted Houston Movie Theater is from Weirdo Family member Christy Butler. The Haunting Little Boy from Nebraska was written by Aaron Stone for MyHauntedLife2.com. The Hunchback Shadow Man is by Nelson for YourGhostStories.com. The Greystone Mansion Murders was written by Troy Taylor. The Green Children of Woolpit was posted at TheLineup.com. Is the White House Haunted was posted at Beyond Reality News. You can find links to all of those stories in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. And a final thought from John Henry Newman. Life passes. Riches fly away. Popularity is fickle. The senses decay. The world changes. One alone is true to us. One alone can be all things to us. One alone can supply our need. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Are you familiar with the concept of shrunken heads? You might think they're just stories from explorers about far-off tribes, plot devices from Gilligan's Island, or a scene from the horror comedy film Beetlejuice, but they're actually quite real. They might be small, but the practice of making shrunken heads has a big history. And that is the topic of this week's Mind of Marlar, which you can find right now by visiting mindofmarlar.com.